So this is the uh, seventh summer that Genome Sciences has been presenting these talks. And I'm Stan Fields. I'm a faculty member in Genome Sciences. Leo Polank is away this evening, so I've taken over for him. And I want to remind you all that following the seminar tonight from Peter Byers, there will be a reception out in the hall right outside of the um, auditorium right here, and you can ask additional questions of our speaker. So tonight's speaker is Peter Byers. Peter is a professor of pathology and of medicine, and he's an adjunct professor in the Department of Genome Sciences. Peter did his MD training at Case Western Reserve University, and then he did his intern and residency in San Francisco and at the NIH. And he came to the University of Washington. Come on in. There are, there are seats out in the front here. Peter came to the University of Washington as a senior fellow in 1974, so next year will mark 40 years that he will be at the University of Washington. He is a distinguished human geneticist. He has been president of the American Board of Medical Genetics. He's been president of the American Society of Human Genetics, and he was editor of the American Journal of Human Genetics. And at the University of Washington, he has directed the medical student research training program, and for 29 years, he directed the medical genetics uh, clinic. And on top of that, Peter has been a great guy to turn to when you need some useful advice, and he has been a, a wonderful colleague for that. Now, many of you may have seen on the poster Peter's seminar title, and you may have been puzzled when you looked at the poster, what does that title mean? In fact, when I looked at the title, I thought, what does this title mean? And it was only um, from Leo Polank about a week ago when he asked me to do this introduction that he explained that there was this email exchange. And he had a message from a member of the Genome Sciences Department saying, what is Peter's title, and can you send me a picture of him? And Leo replied, here's the title, still waiting on a picture. <laughs> so now, every single time I see this title, I chuckle because it's a wonderful title. <laughs> and so I'll turn it over to Peter now to take over. <laughs> So I was going to have a real title, but uh, Stan said it's so much better this way, and I, I, I think I agree with him. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, it, and it's actually a real challenge to try and translate what we do into real language. You know, we speak one kind of language, but everybody in the room speaks a different language, and sometimes it's just hard to do. So if I get kind of off track, raise your hand and say, what did you mean in English? Uh, I, if, if you happen not to speak English as a first language, it's not worth asking me to explain it in that. Uh, but so English will have to do. So as, as Stan said, I'm a medical geneticist. I uh, trained as a physician. Um, I spent a lot of time doing uh, the equivalent of many years of postdoctoral training in, in laboratories and ended up combining the two of them so that I see people in our genetics clinic, so a, a clinic that is devoted to seeing people who have genetic disorders or who are at risk because of their family of uh, developing a genetic disorder or transmitting it to their children. And it's, I think it's actually the best of all worlds in medicine. It, it really is just, it's right there. And in addition to seeing people, we've also developed a diagnostic lab and have a research lab. So everything is sort of hinged on, first of all, seeing people in the clinic and seeing families. So our experimental organism is really people, not fruit flies, not zebrafish uh, or mice. It, it really is people. Um, and we have the advantage of going from the bedside, seeing somebody in the clinic or the, the, the laboratory, the clinic table side, uh, to the nucleotide, the building block of, of genes, and then taking that back and giving that information back to families and uh, explaining what it means in trying to do that. So 
I was, I, I went to medical school because I was going to be a psychiatrist. And I'm, I thought, well, this is about as far removed as you can get from that. In fact, I had a very clear vision of what I was going to do, and, and I had it all worked out. I, I was going to practice as an individual psychiatrist. I would see families or see people, individuals. And <clears throat> uh, the room was a little bit dark. Uh, the couch was kind of red. I'm not sure whether there were red walls or not, but there was uh, Wayden's coating up to here, dark, nice dark wood. I had a big desk, and on that desk I had a box. And when the patient was going to be done, I would open the box, take out a golden key, and give it to the patient, indicating that they had now gotten to the end and had the key to the rest of their lives. It turns out that what I do in the clinic is not all that much different. <laughs> um, I'm not sure that I give out golden keys, and sometimes I think they're pewter or brass or sometimes clay, but at least it's very much the same. And it's talking to people and listening to people, and that's a large part of what we do. So what does asparagus have to do with brittle bones? Well. When you take asparagus and it's raw, you can snap it. If you hold it just right, you can get that nasty end off, and it's perfect for the rest of it. If you boil it, it kind of gets limp and soft. Bones can be soft if they're brittle. But it really is more, it's the opportunity to do an experiment and to, sh and to walk through an experiment with you. And you can see where this is going, right? How many of you eat asparagus? Hands up, everybody, everybody who eats asparagus. Hands up, hands up. Okay, <clears throat> now how many of you don't eat asparagus? How many of you never eat asparagus? You hate it. It's really awful stuff. Not very many. Okay, so there are fewer people, there are fewer people, not everybody put their hands up when I asked if you eat, eat asparagus because there's, those who don't eat it are a much smaller group than I would expect. How many of those of you who eat asparagus can smell something funny in your urine afterwards? Oh, come on, it's not that bad, you know. I mean, it's, okay. So how many of you who eat, so now those of you who eat asparagus and get asparagus pee, right? They th you think everybody does it, right? So how many of you who eat asparagus but don't smell anything unusual in your pee afterwards? Okay, so that's not everybody. So now we have, we've just done, this is an experiment, right? We did an experiment. We took a group of people. We asked how many people in this, in this group eat asparagus. So we defined a population. And now we want to know how many of you make something that, either make it or smell something that comes out in your urine. Okay? Now there's a bunch of you out there that eat asparagus, but you don't smell asparagus in your urine. So why is that? So maybe you don't make whatever is there, or you don't smell it. OK, now this is the tricky part. How many of you who eat asparagus but don't smell something funny in your urine can smell it in somebody else's? <laughs> OK, there's one person brave enough to fess up, and that's because, probably because she has children and she can smell it. In Yes, as a spouse too, or you know, we don't, we're not limited to spice, we could have partners, it could be anything. So that's kind of interesting. Now, how many of you who don't eat asparagus have ever smelled something funny in the bathroom after somebody else in the room has gone? And, <laughs> Aha! Okay. So I remember the first time I ate asparagus was when I was 10. I was in my grandmother's place. My grandmother boiled the stuff so that you couldn't recognize it as asparagus. But I always, <laughs> <coughs> I always knew that there was something very peculiar at my grandmother's house uh, when I went to the bathroom. I didn't understand it. And it wasn't until I was in college that somebody pointed out to me that this is what it is. So we've now done an experiment. We've done this kind of thing. We've grouped people together. We've figured out a, a genetic trait, probably, although we haven't gotten the genetics down yet. But it's something that's different in the population. Some people eat 
asparagus. That may be because you don't eat it for a reason, but it's really kind of bitter and awful. And we have reasons not to eat bitter things. But we also know that there's something in asparagus that makes your urine smell for, for some people. And for some people, they don't smell it either because they don't make it or they make it. So what is this stuff? Well, asparagus is the only vegetable in the world that contains asparagusic acid. It doesn't smell particularly because those sulfur groups, which are the S's there, are fixed. And it's only when they're volatile, that is, that they can go up and they're, they're free, that it smells. So we have ways of metabolizing that compound up there in the upper left-hand corner um, into something that's here. So it's, these are sulfur products which are broken down. So here is somebody who loves asparagus, eats it in this form, and then excretes it in the urine at this form. And here is somebody who is wafting that stuff. Seems to have, be really pleased about it. I'm a little <laughs> surprised about that, but you know, nonetheless. And so we can begin to say that there are people who will metabolize it and make this. Uh, yes, there are probably people who don't metabolize it, and so it doesn't come out. And we could recognize them because they eat asparagus, but they don't smell it in their own urine, but they can smell it in somebody else's. And so we can fill in the pop these boxes if we wanted to. And we know that the majority of people metabolize and smell. There are some who metabolize and don't smell. There are some who don't metabolize and smell. And we don't know whether there are those who don't metabolize and don't smell because we don't have the population here to figure it out. So this is an experiment. And this is an experiment that's different than taking test tubes and doing things. I mean, you could take a test tube, fill it up with uh, asparagus pee, pass it around the room, and we get a really good count on how many people can, uh, can uh, sense it. But we didn't do that. What we did was simply ask questions. So what I'm going to do is talk about these kinds of things with uh, the, these kinds of experiments and kind of ways of looking at people and doing studies on people that begin to help us answer questions. So, I work with a genetic disorder that's called osteogenesis imperfecta. And that's simple. Osteo is bone. Genesis means to make. And imperfecta is imperfect. So it's imperfect bone making. And we call it OI. For those of you of a certain background, it's not OI. That's spelled O-Y. Um, it's not oi ve either. Um, and so, and the question is what? or who is osteogenesis imperfecta, and what do people with it have to teach us about biology, about genetics, uh, about diseases. I'm going to talk about a simple experiment, not unlike the one we just did. And we could all do it, but didn't. Um, something about being right, but being wrong, and being too clever by half. And then something about, was the guy who did the experiment right after all? What's the real story? And then the other part of this talk is that, uh-oh, now the law is on our tail. And then finally, all's well, it ends well. Or is it? So here are our subjects. Here are the people. Here's Robin Wright. Now, these names are real names. They're not made up names. And they're actually in the public domain because the Osteogenesis Imperfecta Foundation, which is an, a peer organization, has published all of this information in their newsletter. So here's Robin Wright. And she works at Sotheby's, and she's their major jewelry um, assayer. So she knows how much every single jewel that goes through Sotheby's is worth. And she's somebody who's average height. And the really distinctive thing that would um, distinguish her from everybody else is that when you walked by her, you'd notice something a little bit unusual about her eyes. And that is that the whites of her eyes were blue. So it could be that color blue, or George Martin color blue. Um, so, but they're distinctly blue. And these women sometimes are really clever. They use blue eyeshadow, and so you can't see it because everything looks blue. And they get an increased number of fractures. Not a lot, uh, but some. Some of them may have actually dozens of fractures during their lifetime. Usually during childhood, then it goes away with puberty and comes back with menopause. Kyle Mulroy is a political consultant in Washington. He's about four and a half feet tall, and he is a dynamo. I walked around the halls of Congress with other people from the OI group with him. Here are 40 people in red shirts, ranging in size from about here to about here. 
and going like crazy, and Kyle is directing everybody else to all the congressional offices, go talk to this one, here's what you need to say, and so forth and so on. He is great. Kristen Andalini just got a law degree from the University of Virginia. She, you, she doesn't really have blue sclery. She's a little bit shorter. Here's her dad who doesn't have it. Here's her mom who doesn't have it. So she has something new in the family. And we'll talk about that genetic part of it in a minute. Here's Jamie Kendall. Uh, she's the human resources director for the government in uh, one of their programs. And a friend of hers, Susie Wilson, who uh, is, uh, uh, helps in medical insurance. This is Tracy Hart, who's actually not the same height. She's squatting down behind the wheelchair that Jamie is in. She's the executive director of the Osteogenesis Imperfecta Foundation. Now, they look like peas in a pod, but if Tracy stands up straight, she's about that tall. So why is this important? We'll come back to that in just a minute. So Jamie lives life in a wheelchair. Uh, Susie is uh, small, but she's actually ambulatory most of the time. And then here's Brennan. Uh, he's, at this point, he's a kid, but he's going to be somebody important when he grows up. Here's Michelle Petrucciani. How many of you are jazz fans? You know Michelle? So Michelle was uh, here uh, uh, many years ago. He's since died. He had the lightest touch on the piano. He uh, has brittle bone disease. He's about just under three feet tall. He could walk, but he was often car carried on stage as part of the act by other members of his band. And then our own Karen Breitmeyer. Karen is uh, a local person. She's not in the audience. There are seats down here. They're free. You don't have to worry about them. No questions asked. Uh, great seats. Um, and Karen uh, has osteogenesis imperfecta. She um, spends most of her time in a wheelchair. She is the chairman of the President's Commission on uh, Architecture for the, for the Disabled. So she's an extraordinarily accomplished woman. And we're very uh, grateful. She actually comes to our medical student lectures um, every uh, year and talks about osteogenesis imperfective with, uh, with the students. So we have hopes about what we do. We don't, you know, studying people is a really interesting thing. And um, we like to think that we're real scientists when we do it. And there are a lot of different kinds of things about why do we study people with heritable disorders. And heritable means that they sometimes, you know, that they can be inherited. So they're genetic disorders. They involve the genes in our in cells. They can be transmitted from generation to generation, from parent to child, when they have different patterns of inheritance. So we call them heritable, which means they can be inherited. They aren't always, and you'll see the reasons in, in a little bit. So why do we do this? Well, the first is to solve problems for the family. Uh, people who have genetic disorders uh, have rare conditions. And most physicians, when they're trained, don't learn about them and don't understand them. So they don't know very much about them. And often, people with rare disorders, unless they're classically described in the textbook, are missed. The, the diagnosis is often missed. And so studying people and making that information more generally available really helps with being able to inform physicians and, and make the diagnosis um, easier. And it ends what we call the diagnostic odyssey. That is people going from doctor to doctor to doctor trying to find somebody who knows, knows what's wrong. It provides for a specific diagnosis. And if we have a specific diagnosis, it means that we often can tell some very clear idea about what to expect over a lifetime. Um, when are your fractures going to stop? Are they going to start again? Are there particular bones that might be a problem? If you have brittle bones, are you at risk for something else? You know, are you going to get cancer? Are you going to get Alzheimer's? Are you going to get you know, anything else? What's the story about that sort of stuff? Because people worry about that. Um, it also helps. Mothers are absolutely sure that every child that has something wrong with them is their fault. And this helps to spread the, you know, spread the anxiety we can get fathers involved to get them very anxious that maybe they were the ones that were responsible. You'll see that in a minute. Uh, family planning. So we can uh, ask about if there's a recurrence risk, what can we do about it? Can we plan ahead? Can we intervene in ways? And then also perhaps to provide specific therapies. So that's one part of it. The second is we really want to understand how a change in a gene uh, leads to the clinical changes in the person. So if we talk you know, gene talk and stuff, we call that genotype, which is the description of a mutation. 
and phenotype, which is a description of a person. And how do you get from one to the other? It's a very complicated pathway, and for most genetic conditions, we're still struggling with that as an idea. The other thing is that in the back of our minds, we really think that if you change one gene and even one part of a gene in a person, that the differences that you see in that person will clue us in to some fundamental biological changes and some fundamental biology. And so we always have in the back of their mind that maybe this person, this family, is going to be the one that gives us that clue and helps us to understand what's going on. We're usually wrong. So I'm going to talk about a simple experiment. And it's very much like what we just did with asparagus, except it's with people. In 1979, David Salentz, who was a clinical geneticist uh, in uh, Melbourne, in Australia, decided he wanted to know why people who had a diagnosis of osteogenesis imperfecta looked so different, one from the other. And you could see, so you could see somebody like this, who is uh, uh, like the first person we saw in the picture, blue sclery. Uh, the whites of his eyes are blue, average stature, some fractures. Here's a baby that died in the newborn period. These are the x-rays, and this is the baby. Here's some of the x-rays from somebody who's milder, and here's somebody with x-rays who are milder. Looks very much like Karen Breitmeyer, for example, uh, in, in the group. And so what David recognized was that there was a real enormous range in severity from lethal in the newborn period to very mild out here. And so he did something very simple. He got his hands on medical records and saw as many people as he could and had x-rays and took family histories. That is, do you have an affected parent? Are your parents related before marriage? Um, you know, it's very simple questions like that. And, and on the basis of that, he thought that there were four different groups, and he called them types. One, two, three, and four. Now, you'd think that the types, you'd think that one might be mild and four would be severe or uh, But it turns out that this was an adaptation of a nomenclature that was used, that there were only two types. One was mild and one was lethal. And so he had to add the other numbers to keep things more or less uh, similar to what they had been before. So the first kind was called OI type 1. It was mild. It was dominantly inherited. And I'll show you a picture of what that means. Um, and people had an average lifespan. Uh, you know, it was normal. There was a second variety, which was lethal in the newborn period. So it was like these guys. And he thought it was recessively inherited. He thought this kind, which was more uh, quite severe, but milder than these guys, was also uh, recessively inherited. And then this was kind of a leftover form, like this guy, that he thought was relatively rare, but was dominantly inherited. So what does dominant inheritance mean? Well, it means we all have two copies of every gene in our body. Uh, we have two copies of each chromosome as well. And one copy of the gene is on one of those uh, chromosome partners and one's on another. And the two genes that are responsible for most of the people that have osteogenesis imperfecta are called type 1 collagen genes. And those genes, one cop there's one gene that's on chromosome 17. So we have two chromosome 17s. And there's the other one is on chromosome 7. We have two chromosome 7s. So with a dominant disorder, what you can see is here in this case, the parents are unaffected, but something has changed. So now this filled in circle means that there's an affected copy, an altered copy of the gene, and this person has a clinical condition. In this case, we'll call it osteogenesis imperfecta. So when that person has children, we only pass on one copy. And we do that because if we passed on two copies and the other parent passed on two, then there'd be four, and then the next generation would be eight, and then it would be just a mess. And we wouldn't have gotten where we are now if we had done that. So we, we have developed over time, very quickly actually, a very efficient system for dividing up the genome exactly down the middle and sending one copy of every chromosome um, into each egg or each sperm. Now, I know that most of you in the room don't believe that those things exist and know that we don't, trans we don't use anything like sex to transmit things. But if we were to do that, um, that we would, in that case, only transmit one copy of every gene so that 
when that egg is fertilized, which is this imaginary event that occurs in some blind space that we don't know about, then we would reconstitute it and we would have two copies of every gene again. So this guy who's affected can transmit either that copy or that copy, so that copy or that copy, and his partner here can transmit either that copy or that copy. So it means that uh, when this one combines with either that or that, we get that. So it means that the chance of transmitting this disorder to the next generation is 50%. Good for you. Well done. Okay. So what about recessive inheritance? Well, that's different. In this case, a parent will have an altered and an unaltered copy of the gene, and so does the other parent. But they're not affected. They don't have the genetic disorder because this normal copy is perfectly okay to carry on business. But if by chance they transmit this one and this one and this child is born, that person now has a genetic disorder. So what's the chance that this would happen again? Well, it's only this group, one, two, three, four, and so the chance of it happening again in the SIB ship is a quarter. A quarter. Great. <laughs> Good. So 25%. So it's quite different. And then what about the next generation? So he can only pass on those and those, she can only pass on those and those. None of them are affected. Of course, there is a chance that she could be a carrier. And for common disorders like cystic fibrosis, for example, or some of the other conditions that are relatively common, the carrier frequency is high enough that we can see it happen unexpectedly in that situation. But that's not usually the case. So why is that relevant to OI? Well, here's Jamie. And here's Susie. They look pretty much the same. They're about the same height. But Jamie has a recessively inherited form of OI. We'll talk about that a little bit more. And Susie has a dominantly inherited form. So she, if she gets pregnant, she has a 50% chance of having an affected child. If Jamie gets pregnant, we would not expect her to have an affected child. So they need to know that ahead of time. Because S Jamie, who was the president of the OI Foundation, thought she had a dominantly inherited disorder. And when we told her she didn't, she said, can I still be the president of the OI Foundation? Because <laughs> she had Brooks syndrome, which has a different name, but it looks just like OI, except people get joint contractures. OK. So here's, when David Salentz did this study, he had, he had pedigrees and families that looked like this. So here is a unaffected pair, and they had one, two, three affected children. So that's a pretty high recurrence rate, right? That looks like 25% with a little bit more. And then here's another family. Here are our first cousins who got married. So we don't think highly of first cousin marriages often, right? I mean, these are kind of no-no. But pro I, when I was a kid, I had the hots for my cousin. I thought she was <laughs> terrific. Fortunately, she was not in line for me. But I think we all, at some point or another, imagine this kind of thing just because families are close. Um, but in some, in some societies, these are preferred marriages. So in the Middle East, we often see that. And, this, and it turns out. So here, this person can have gotten an altered copy of the gene from here through here to here and this person from here, here. So in families like this, we often see recessive inheritance. And we see disorders due to recessive inheritance. So this is the information that David had that said that the lethal form of osteogenesis imperfecta, and you can see the x-rays, these are femurs. So these bones have been compressed just by the muscles. The muscles are stronger than the bone, and they just compress them. Very strong muscles, very weak bones. And you can see the ribs are really abnormal in this one. So he thought on the basis of finding a number of families like this that the lethal forms of osteogenesis imperfecta were recessively inherited. So this is where being right but being wrong and being too clever by half got, gets us into trouble. So we were really interested in this idea. And so we did, we did an experiment that was very much like what David Salentz did. And we collected x-rays 
and clinical information about a whole set, actually 65 families, in which there was a lethal form of osteogenesis imperfecta. And in those families, all but five of them, one, two, three, four, five, had only a single affected child. So sometimes it was the only child, and so you couldn't really tell what the story was. But sometimes there was more than one. And so when, if you add up, so if we have 65 families, and we looked at the number of affecteds among the siblings, there were six, six others, so they're all here. And there were 64 unaffected children out of a total of 70. So 25% of 70, which is what we would expect to be the recurrence risk, would be, you can figure, I don't know what that is, it's half of 35, so it's 17 and a half children. Now I don't, you can account for that half a child as you want to, but it would be about 17 children. We only got six. So six out of 70 is you know, just a little less than 10%, and 10% is not a genetic number. So genetic numbers are one and two for the number of copies of genes that we have. They're 25% or 50%, or four. Four is a genetic number because we have four building blocks, nucleotides of DNA, A, C, G, and T. So, but 10 is not a genetic number. So how do you get that? Well, let's look at those families, okay? Okay, here's a family that's had, here's an unaffected, unaffected, and two affected children. That could be compatible with recessive inheritance, right? Here's another one, and now we've got, now we raise the ante because we have consanguinity. These people are related before birth. That's what the double bar means. And we have two affected children. And here's a guy who had no affected out of eight children with his first uh, partner. And now he's got two affected children here. And this couple um, has three affected and three unaffected children. What about that one? Well, that's kind of strange, isn't it? I mean, here she has had, with this guy has had two affected, and with this guy has had one affected, and she has one unaffected child. Okay, so this is, this, get your thinking hats on, because this one's, this one, you gotta think about it, okay? Well, the simple explanation is that there's something going on, that this is recessive and these guys are brothers, okay? Could be, that'd be a good explanation. These two guys are brothers. The second is that these two people are related prior to marriage and they didn't really fess up to it, so we don't have a double bar there. And he's actually the father of this child. He's the father of this one. <laughs> so that doesn't really happen anywhere in you know, society. Actually about, yes. it does, <laughs> you know? <laughs> ah, we have some experience about that. <laughs> Actually, about 7% of people um, who, so for those of you who are in the audience who are worried about this and are thinking that maybe you were adopted or maybe your father is not really your father, the chances are very high that, that that's not the case, okay? So you don't have to worry about it too much, but you can ask if you're really interested in it. <laughs> and your dad will really tell you, yeah. These are completed gestations. Do you yeah. have records for these families of in No. I, this is just what we, we did, but I didn't put it on there. So, yeah. I just wanted to take care of the sake because those had been studied prior. They were you mean, if the, would the recurrence risk be higher? Yeah. No. We think that these are all the ones that are relevant. So anyway, this raised questions for us about what to do. And we had ideas about it, but we weren't sure what was happening. And what we really wanted was a family like this one. So here's the dad, he's got this child over here who's affected and this child over here that's affected. So this was really interesting. So this family was sent to us by Bruce Blumberg who's a geneticist in, um, in San Francisco and Dan Cohn who was a fellow in our lab uh, really worked out what this mechanism is. So the first thing we did, by that time we could sequence the genes and we could figure out what was actually wrong with this child. So there was a single change in, in one of the collagen genes and in only one copy of the gene in this person. So this is 2-1, it's this child. 
Okay. So we had DNA from the other child, and we studied it. And if I haven't made a typographical mistake, those two should be identical. So this child and this child have the same mutation, and it affects only one copy of the gene. Okay. So this story was actually a little bit more interesting than that. It, it, um, when this child was born, he was walking out of the room with a genetic counselor, not with a doctor, but with a genetic counselor. So those of you who are interested in doing genetics and want to be somebody on the front lines, genetic counseling is a tremendous uh, thing, a tremendous kind of job. And he was talking to the genetic counselor, and he said, you know, it's really kind of odd. Um, my girlfriend, who was this one, had a baby just like this one about three or four months ago. And that was what led us actually to, to this, seeing this family and finding them. So that information was not what we knew about at the beginning. So we then could study mom one and mom two, and they had no mutation. So there wasn't a second mutation that might account for this happening. And then we studied the dad. So we had blood. And the DNA taken from white cells is representative of all of the genes that you have. We had hair roots. So if you pluck your hair, for the, those of you who have hair, um, <laughs> and look at the root of the hair, that little bulb at the bottom has cells in it, and we can get DNA from there, uh, from skin. And then Bruce was kind enough to ask him to give us a sperm sample, and he was kind enough to give it to us. And when we studied all of them, one out of four cells has the mutation. So three quarters of his cells didn't have the mutation, and only a quarter of them had it. So that's a little odd. So he has the mutation. He's clinically normal. He doesn't have any clinical effects for it. But he can transmit that mutation to this child and to that child. So this is a phenomenon known as mosaicism. Those of you who know about mosaics, they're tiles, and you can go a mosaic, you can see it in many bathroom floors, tiles of different colors. If you have two different colors, then you would have cells that have the mutation and cells that have the mutation here and cells that don't. And so in this person, what happened was very early in his formation, there was a mutation that occurred that created that susceptibility to osteogenesis imperfecta. But it was only in some of his cells. And when we make, we divide those cells very early on into cells that are going to make our arms and our legs and our gut and our liver and our brain into somatic cells <coughs> and into germline. And those are the cells that are ultimately going to come back and populate the uh, ovary and the testis. And so this is where the DNA that's going to be transmitted to the next generation goes. Now, one out of four of the cells that were in the testis, uh, in sperm, in his sperm, uh, had the mutation. That's a very small number, and it, it, it means, and when we've gone and looked at other families, it's consistent with there being a very small set of cells that's set aside for the germline very early in embryogenesis and now transmits uh, that genome to the next generation. Now, I would never have expected to find that out from looking at people and trying to figure it out. And yet, it's one of the things that we get from this, and that is that a very small number of cells is settled, set aside into the germline. Here, the example is two, but it could be three or four. It could be up to you know a, a, a dozen or so, but it's not a big number. It's a very small number. And so we put, in a sense, all of our genetic eggs in a very small number of baskets. And we have to preserve that very carefully over time. So the other thing that was kind of peculiar about this was we sent this paper to a journal, um, a very high prestige journal, of course, because we thought that this was very important. And at the time, there was this idea that spermatogenesis, that is making sperm, cycled around the testis. So it would be here and here and here and here. And so we had a sperm sample from this guy that we represented 
sperm generation from this part of the testis. And the editor of the journal wrote us back and said, we'd be very interested in this paper, but we can't exclude the possibility that what you're measuring just measures what's happening in that small part of the testis. And it would be very nice if you had another sperm sample. <laughs> so it's the only example I know of <laughs> where a journal editor of a prestigious medical journal and scientific journal asks us to send a guy out to the back room with a set of things and provide a sperm sample. Well, he did. And it turned out the numbers were the same. So it's a very interesting adventure through medicine. And here's an example of something we had no right to expect that we would identify. You, you want to know how he did it? No. <laughs> 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 no, I'm wondering the, whether the mosaicism is consistent in all humans, or was, it, was he somehow unique um, yeah. in that mosaicism? Yeah, yeah. Very interesting question. So we asked that. It turns, so this is a dominantly inherited disorder. It only means that uh, one copy of the gene needs to be affected. And in fact, what happened was that uh, when, after this was identified as a mechanism, almost every dominant disorder that's been identified has a small number of people that have this mechanism. And in fact, you know, with every cell division, uh, we induce mutations. They're, they're, replication is not perfect. Uh, um, if it were perfect, we'd still be viruses uh, because it's the driver of evolution. So there has to be change that occurs over time. And that change can hit a portion of the genome that encodes proteins and so can give rise to a clinical picture like this. Or it can just be buried deep in the, you know, in the recesses of the genome and probably not be there. But this is common. And there are also genes that uh, when mutations occur in them, give rise in the mosaic form to uh, genetic disorders. So it's a, it's, this is part of what we are as, as individuals. We're part of a genome that is constantly changing. Okay. So now the question is, was David right? Was David Slants right? And the answer is, well, yeah, because we and other people who were studying disorders kept finding families like this looking in these people but not being able to show that they were, uh, that the parents were, a parent was mosaic or that they had mutations in type 1 collagen genes. And we had some that were consanguineous, we had some that were not consanguineous, but we saw uh, recurrence in the families. And it turned out that by that time we could sequence these two genes, these are the type 1 collagen genes that um, it, it, uh, is, make the major protein in bone, and that about 90 Five percent or so of, of people who had osteogenesis imperfecta had mutations here, and there was this unknown subset where we hadn't identified the genes. And then, as a consequence of a very rapid evolution of the field, it was possible first by looking at some uh, inbred populations, like the First Nations communities in uh, in Canada, to recognize that there were recessively inherited forms of OI genes like this one, which are or what affect uh, Jamie uh, that you saw, Jamie Kendall that you saw earlier. And then beginning in 2006, a whole series of genes was identified by a couple of different mechanisms. One was we had a good idea about what gene to look at, and we looked at it, and we found abnormalities. And the second was a new uh, uh, technique that became available just a few years ago, which is actually to sequence all the coding region of all the genes in the body and look for uh, changes that are there that would explain this. And that's been responsible for this second half of the, of the list over here. And these genes are actually quite interesting. Most of them here make proteins that help to process collagen molecules in the cell before they're uh, secreted outside the cell. Some of them control the calcium, the intra, uh, uh, intracellular environment, which is important for making proteins fold correctly. And then others of them are important for making bone cells at the beginning. And so if you don't have enough cells in bone, then you can give rise to that. So David was right, and he was wrong. Um, we've actually been able to go back and get some of the cells from people that he studied initially and identify the mutations in, this, in some of the ones in this list of genes to show that he really was right and that his idea about recessive inheritance was right, but it was incomplete. 
So the real story is now represented here, and you can see that still about 95% of the genes still are here. We just have names for everything else that's there. Same diagram. So now the law is on our tail. So this started in this fashion. So did you hear there's a new genetic test for OI that will recognize about 90% of affected people? I'm using 90% because the calculations that you'll see in a minute are easier to do if I say 90 instead of 95%. So the defense attorney in a case of child abuse says, great, that'll mean that we can leave the window open so that even with a normal test, there's a 10% chance that the kid has OI. We'll never get to the, the standard of beyond a reasonable doubt if we just use that test. And so our client, the potential abuser, will be guilty. <laughs> And the prosecutor says, now we can get the abusers for sure. Because we got a really good test and we're going to get them. Okay. So it turns out this works for dogs too. Um, you're not really familiar with dog abuse, but uh, it happens. And one of the most interesting things that happened was actually we got involved in a case of dog abuse. And usually I don't go testify at those cases, but somehow I was so intrigued by this that we tested the dog, we found a normal test, and <clears throat> got to go to Breckenridge, Colorado to, to testify in a case of dog abuse. And in fact, the guy had apparently beaten his dog up. So, <clears throat> so child abuse is um, present at almost epidemic proportions in our society. And we, um, we have uh, about, so if we're going to use this, so people are now aware, and I was very surprised when this started, but realized that, okay, there is a use for it. And this is how genetics and science now gets translated into the popular domain. And people have to learn how to use information and have to learn what it means. So we started off, we actually used a different form of test where we could identify 87% of individuals who had non-lethal forms of OI. So we excluded all the people with lethal forms and we studied them. And our genetic testing is now better. We can identify 99% of people who, we can identify something wrong in about 99% of people that we test. But uh, at the time that we did these kinds of studies, we started off, we could identify you know, a little less than 90%. And now we can do more. So what's the context for what happens? Well, osteogenesis imperfecta has a frequency in the population of about 1 in 10,000. We have about 4 million births in the country, in the United States, every year. And so 1 out of 10,000 of those would have OI. So there would be about 400 kids with OI born every year. Every year, there are about 25,000 children, perhaps more, who come to the emergency room with unexplained fractures. There are lots more that come with explained fractures. And that's in the age group of, say, zero to two or so. So if we take that window, it would mean that we have somewhere between, uh, in that whole time, we would have somewhere between oh, 800 and 1,000 or so kids that have been born during that time on the background of 25,000 kids who are injured uh, probably not by accident. So we call it nicely, we call it non-accidental injury, non-accidental trauma. <clears throat> so the important thing is, if this kid comes into the emergency room, to make sure that you know whether this child has OI. So you can do it on clinical grounds if you're an experienced clinician. You can look at the child and you can look to see whether there's bone deformity. Um, <clears throat> But for the most part, we're looking at kids that are not, in whom the diagnosis is not obvious. <clears throat> they may have blue sclerae, but those of you who have had children, or are children, know that you can have bluish sclerae up to the time you were about 18 months old. So one of my kids, I was sure, had osteogenesis imperfecta uh, because he had blue sclerae up until he was 18 months old. He doesn't. Um, but it would have been very embarrassing if he'd had a fracture and I had to take him to the emergency room and, or have his mother take him to the emergency room. That would have been even worse um, <clears throat> because I would have been at home and I would have been the bad guy, obviously. <clears throat> so it's important. And how, do we, how good are we at distinguishing that small group from the large group? 
And what does that testing require? So we can, let's say we can identify just uh, 90%. So remember the defense attorney said, that's great. Um, I test these kids, I test my client, or I test my, the child of my client, and I find nothing wrong. He still has a 10% chance of having osteogenesis imperfecta, right? Okay, so let's do another experiment. We have, I don't know, maybe 100 people in the room. I'm going to make the assumption, although I may be wrong, that none of you has osteogenesis imperfecta. Okay? So if we tested everybody and found that nobody has a test, a positive test for osteogenesis imperfecta, could we say that 10% of the people in the room have OI? Would that make sense to you? Because you've already, you've already done the first test. You've looked at everybody in the room, and nobody in the room has OI. So the defense attorney's not quite right, right? 10%, that's not right. So there's not a 10% chance. It doesn't work that way. Well, why is that? Why are we not able to do that? Well, we're testing a different group than we tested originally. Remember, originally we tested all the people, we collected people who all had osteogenesis imperfecta, and we couldn't identify something wrong in some of them. So some of them had recessive forms, and we didn't test for that. Some of them is just technical stuff that we, we couldn't get around. But now we're taking a different group of people. We're taking a group of people that's walked in off the street, went to Fahey, got over here, and now you're sitting in the room. And none of you has a positive test, but also, None of you has osteogenesis imperfecta. So what's the population that's going to be tested uh, when we get the sample from the kid in the emergency room? Okay. So here's how it kind of works. So here's the original group that we had. We had 100 people who had osteogenesis imperfecta. And out of that group, we could identify 90. So we miss 10. But that's not who we're testing. That's not what the group is like, right? Would we think that 50% of the kids who goes to the emergency room would have osteogenesis imperfected? Not very likely. But if it were 50%, then we would miss five. If 25% of the kids who went to the emergency under, uh, room under those circumstances had osteogenesis imperfected, those are the red ones here, we'd miss two and a half. I'd be very sad about the half, but still. <laughs> if 10%, we would miss one. And if 5%, so 5% is about what we would get if we didn't filter anybody out. That if we had all the people with OI and all the kids who had been fra had fractures, this is about what the, the population would be. We would miss a half. So if you take that and then, so, what we're concerned about is that group out of uh, missing it. And so it turns out that if you do the numbers right, if the test identifies 90% of all individuals with OI in the population tested, and we expect to have OI in the test group, uh, the number, the proportion is about 5%, then in the presence of a normal test, the likelihood that the tested individual has OI is about 1 in 191. So is that beyond a reasonable doubt? It's getting close. It's not absolutely there. But what it means is that the prosecutor has a better chance and does better by doing this test than the defense attorney does. And the defense attorney might do better by not testing the kid at all uh, because they're still raised the question about whether or not it could be. So we found ourselves, as I said, unexpectedly uh, looking, being involved in legal cases, and we still are, about... You know, we get 100 to 200 samples a year that we're testing for that and always have to talk with the, the people about it and try and explain what it means. And what you can see is that the explanations are not always exactly what you expect. But it is a great chance to do that. So we still haven't found all the causes of OI, and particularly we don't understand the pathway, that is, how you get from having something wrong in a gene to how you have a clinical presentation 
and we don't have very effective treatments that target the major features. So we haven't finished. So we have people in this room for whom we expect them to come and join us. We hope that you will see this as a way to do, uh, as, a, as a lifetime occupation, because it is a lifetime of work to do this and, and to get going to the next uh, step, to identify what's wrong with the other people, and also to help to identify ways to treat people. So it takes a lot of people to do this kind of work. Uh, we have laboratory directors. Ulrika has been with us for 17 years. Melanie uh, has been doing this for more than 20 years. She's a genetic counselor and has made an enormous difference to how uh, we work with families and work with people. Postdocs, so Dan Cohn did all the work that, about identifying mosaicism. Um, and other people, so Helena and Shauna, were very much involved in identifying the genes that are involved in recessive forms of osteogenesis imperfecta. Lots of people um, help us. We have lots of terrific technicians in the group. We get funding from here. But perhaps the most important set of people that's involved in this kind of science are the families and the clinicians, the families who agree to have uh, samples sent, and the clinicians who are involved in sending them. So, there is nothing, there is no job in medicine that's better than this job. And for those of you who are too old to go back to doing it, I'm sorry. But for those of you who are young enough to think about doing it, it's a great job to have. Thanks. <laughs>